It's great to be here. I'm Johanna. This is Sasha. We're from 5468796 Architecture. And uh, we have had absolute blast in Alaska over the last couple of days. Um, and um, we're just really excited to um, also be here in Juneau and have noticed some great parallels between uh, Winnipeg, where we come from in Canada, and here. And we'll talk about that a lot. But before we get to that, um, just a couple of uh, background things about us. Um, I originally came from Finland. I love looking at this map from the top down and kind of seeing how we're on pretty much on axis, at least with um, Anchorage uh, from Helsinki. And then, of course, oops, Sasha um, is completely off the map, and he sort of squeezed himself into the, <laughs> into into the, the series show, yeah. at the last minute. Anyway, um, I first learned about uh, Alaska through uh, Donald Duck. Um, which was a comic book that I read as Actually, a kid. Actually, Scrooge, right? Well, Scrooge, who was in Alaska, right? So um, it, I've always held a really romantic picture of Alaska, which I think many people do, and uh, it's amazing it's after, been reinforced you know, in the last couple of days. 30 sure. years to be here, that's right. Yeah. We have to say that we've done Anchorage first and Fairbanks last night, and, and Juno certainly won our hearts. Uh, mm -hmm. This place is spectacular. I'm sure that's where Scrooge would want to be as well. That's right. Um, but then back to Winnipeg. So um, it is the uh, a prairie city in the middle of uh, the continent, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, uh, we have a similar issue to you, I think, where we're very isolated. Um, our closest city, uh, big city, would be eight hours drive south to Minneapolis. And so there's quite a distance to cover. And I think one of the things that's parallel to, to here then is that somehow you have to create your own culture. Um, as a result of that. And that's something that really, I think, breeds innovation and, and, and breeds that sort of resilience and resourcefulness that uh, we need to run architectural practice. So we have extreme winter uh, or extreme weather, uh, winter being particularly the one that Winnipeg's known for, Winter Bay, Peg, um, as it's you know, been titled. But, um, and it's often seen as, as being one of those challenges that you really can't overcome or the city is not going to be vibrant because it's too cold. But um, I think that what really colors our practice and colors the, the culture in Winnipeg these days is that we've started to really learn how to turn that into an opportunity. And how to embrace it. So mm -hmm. we'll talk about that a little bit. But we're here, of course, representing all of the people in our office. And there are, in this picture, 12, but we're now 14. And uh, we work around a single table, so 44 feet long. And we'll believe that this is really important for creating a culture where the best idea wins, not who it uh, came from. And it could be our accountant, or it could be the youngest intern who voices that idea. And uh, it really is trying to make sure that we remain critical. Back to you, Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> well, Winnipeg, what was interesting about Winnipeg, it's, uh, as we said, isolated, but it was in, in the early 1900s, it, it was the uh, third largest city in Canada. And what was interesting about it, it um, was called or touted Chicago of the North. It, um, it relied on the grain industry and so on. And the, just with the introduction of Panama Canal, the First World War, and we had a big general strike, that all died. So uh, that was at the same time, uh, we see it as, as sort of, a great, one of the greatest things that happened to Winnipeg because what happened is we got to preserve all of our old architecture and the, uh, we had to uh, develop the entire culture for ourselves. So we didn't become one, one of those gigantic regional centers, but we became a place where things are brewing and that's one of the things that we feel in, in Alaska. And then uh, in the 50s, uh, we had a whole bunch of people from Chicago, great architects, uh, a school from the IIT, come really up uh, to Winnipeg and start having these great sort of mid-century visions about what the future could look like. But as a result of that, they leveled pretty much a big part of the downtown. And this map here represents something that we have a dubious title of having 
the most surface parking lots per capita in the world in Winnipeg. More so. than Anchorage, believe it or not. So yes. the, uh, <laughs> that's what our downtown looks like. Every red square or a red shape is it's a surface parking lot. It's just a desolate thing. So this is what we're trying to fight. Um, but um, at the time when we entered then the architecture scene by starting our office in 2007, uh, we uh, dubbed Vancouver uh, as Winnipeg West because most of our colleagues had left. There really wasn't seemingly a future uh, for architects in, in, in Winnipeg. And then similarly, London, England was Winnipeg East because we just had more colleagues in both of those towns. Um, at the time. Parties were great in London and Winnipeg parties were great in London. Yeah, that's right. Time. Not anymore, they've come back. But like we said, uh, Winnipeg is this sort of winter city and uh, just recently I think with the, the dialogue about why you know that's no longer a challenge but it's really an opportunity has really shifted and I think we see that every day in the street picture today. Um, Winnipeg used to be pretty beige, so after the 50s, you know, after this sort of boom of architecture, then there was kind of a depression again for uh, 20, 30 years. There were no new startups in architecture at all, and um, I think the quality of the work that was produced was not the greatest um, at that time, and, and something was really lacking. There really wasn't momentum or collective spirit in the, in the city. Then in the uh, early 2000s, we then got a couple of bigger projects. The Manitoba Hydro Building went up for um, regional hydro um, utility. utility. Uh, the new Winnipeg Airport was built by Cesar Pelli, and then we had a, a museum by Anton Predock, the first museum outside of the capital, uh, federal museum for ever, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there started to be a new invigoration about what design could do for a city. And um, then in terms of what we believe in, we believe that the design quality should be maintained. An architect has not only that responsibility, but also has a responsibility to bring, bring sort of technical sound that's new to, to projects, social and civic quality that we have to maintain. Uh, we also need to spruce the culture uh, in our city, as mentioned now several times already. <coughs> advancing the profession in some way, and we of course have an environmental responsibility. And all those things would be you know, doable if it wasn't for the budget. That's always the hindrance point. So um, it, you know, this picture is really trying to tell you that we can't borrow from one bottle to make the other one work, but all of them have to stay full. And that we take sort of very personally. So when we, when we first started, we were lucky to, to get uh, two condos in this old building and, and got to develop them to our own taste. The time where uh, we were told that clients are not interested in things that are different from, from ordinary and so on. And actually, they, those became calling cards. So that's the only reason we're, we're showing this, that they brought us work. And that's how we got work initially. Then early on, uh, we launched also a campaign we tried to sell to our regional association, the Manitoba uh, Association of Architects, by you know, borrowing a lot of these uh, well-known ad campaigns at the time. Uh, we had a asking to get sued. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> And so here's a couple of them. And what we were hoping to do <laughs> is to uh, try and say that you know, with very small investment, you could actually get a really good return on that um, return on that investment. And today, actually, all of these things are being done in our city. So we're trying. We, we, we've started to uh, to do many things uh, having to do with architecture being part of the culture. But other big lesson to us was very early on, we got um, a couple of developers to work with, private developers, who then uh, taught us that uh, in order for us to get any sort of design quality out of projects, we really had to understand our numbers. We had to understand what thing co things cost, how they were built, and if we could meet the performa criteria, meaning you know if the client could make money, then we could probably squeeze some architecture out of the projects. And we as architects have tools like area and volume and size and the amount of materials that we can affect the budgets. But the reason we need to understand and perception, we, the reason we need to understand the numbers is, is to understand how all these things fit. So we started not only looking at the design quality, but we also started analyzing all of our projects in this manner. So the, the square foot cost, you know, how many residents per acre you could get out of a project and so on. So it really boils back down to numbers and it doesn't sound all that, you know, magical that way, but it's really a necessary part of, um, of I think, running a practice. Mm -hmm. One of the first projects, and this is for our previous uh, uh, company that we worked for, Colmar Architects, one of the first projects that Johanna and I collaborated on, saw us build this little uh, infill project on a, on a small residential lot downtown, and the, we fit, in essence, seven units plus four flex spaces. But what we really learned about this, this uh, typology was that we've trained, trying to create a public space in which 
uh, residents can take part in. This, these pictures were taken the first day everybody moved in. Uh, one of the people that moved in was my brother. I was taking pictures for posterity, for architects, and the, uh, he came out, talked to me, and the, in, in the next about half an hour, people started looking down from the windows, came down the door, started talking to him. They sort of, they all congregated. As you can see on the bottom right, they were leaving out for dinner. Those people have never seen each other before. And the, uh, the fact that we've created a, a space in which they actually got to know each other was, was, uh, was a great, one of the greatest lessons uh, here. Then they had a Facebook page and Twitter and all of that stuff um, that came out with, with a little, little community. So this was really something that struck us as being uh, what we needed to do to kind of try to reinvigorate Winnipeg. And that comes down to that civic responsibility that I mentioned before and trying to understand how we actually engage in building a city. Um, when we look at Helsinki again, my, down, uh, my hometown, and we look at the size of it in terms of the square footage um, compared to uh, Winnipeg's area, uh, Helsinki is twice as dense and its downtown is seven times as dense, and yet it has no tall buildings. And um, we have always been wondering why that is and why, we, why we can't convince people to live in multifamily housing, for example, in this urban setting, which would make sense. And then uh, it occurred to us that perhaps it has something to do with the spaces in between buildings. It has to do with these kinds of places where kids can play and uh, where you can forge friendships for, for life. Uh, there's a Finnish for, uh, word uh, called piha, and it means yard, and it means actually the sort of collective yard. And, and instead of saying that you're from a building complex or building, oh, you, uh, you say you're from that yard. And I think what that does is it, it tells you how we place value differently uh, on the kinds of uh, urban uh, spaces. And this is then uh, the same spot in Winnipeg where I first... Uh, first moved into, and you can see what dominates that is not swings and, and sandboxes, but it is a garbage can and a, and a parking lot. And so the first project we're going to talk about is, is, is a project where we've, um, we've started using some of these things that we've talked about earlier on. It's a little infill project, and the, the first picture was showing a courtyard. Uh, it's in essence, this is a picture of the houses across the street, so it's rough, it's, it's tough, it's, it's abrasive kind of environment. The, uh, the client had uh, six um, residential lots in L shape and they wanted to fit about 25 units and we've tried pretty much any standard form in order to put this in and they tried townhouses, tried stacked, stacked townhouses. Uh, we tried to keep it down to three stories which has to do with budget and building codes and so on and allow it to be you know, built out of wood and not be sprinkled and, so and so on. So there's a lot of cost savings. And nothing worked. Mode. So the, uh, we, we then said, okay, well, let's start from, from, from square one and let's look at how small a room can actually be. So decided that the smallest room is actually eight feet or can, the smallest dimension could be eight feet and discovered that pretty much everything can fit into that width except for a living room and a master bedroom. So they kind of bulge out. Um, you can see here on the sort of general spine and then we have these little bits that, uh, that stick out. And uh, that became the sort of mode in which we were designing in. And we had two people in the back of the office building this thing out of Legos and trying to get more and more density uh, onto the site. And eventually when we stacked it right, we noticed that we of course get these spaces in between. So we get a little courtyard, we get a kind of a muse that goes through. And what we envisioned is that life could actually take place um, outside of the, the units, on multiple levels, on the rooftops, you know, with sort of pictured laundry hanging there and, and thinking that, you know, even when there's winter, that you can certainly sort of expand your space this way and add the collective to the individual space. So here you can see the street that cuts through and you can actually drive down this. The city has allowed us to, uh, to put cars through, but it's a street where this wasn't staged. Uh, most of our photographs are staged, these ones weren't, and this <laughs> is where people were actually um, being, uh, being in the space and using the space. The key aspect of design here, it's very basic, it's built out of stick frame, two by ten, um, for, it's a maximum size. For, for construction, is the maximum size of lumber they've used and so on. But, but the key in, in the project, as you might have noticed, is that there's about 200 windows. And th those literally became eyes on the street that Jane Jacobs talks about. And while the project is in a fairly rough area, uh, it doesn't have any security cameras, it doesn't have any, um, gates. any gates, it doesn't have any sort of things that you think about protecting a place with, but the, it's protected purely by actually defensible space, the space that, that people can see. And Winnipeg is known to be a basement bargain kind of environment where everything has to be cheaper and it has to be done like it always used to be done. And what you should know is that we can pretty much afford three gladding types, 
three facade types. That's stucco, uh, it's uh, you know, met uh, metal panel of some sort, or corrugated metal, or it's cementitious or concrete panel uh, or that we can afford. Well, that's the same thing. Right. Right? Okay, so what we believe then is that bigger is not better, but better is better. And then maybe the way that we need to save is not on sort of um, compromising everything, trying to bring the design in because we, we actually can convince people that design can, can allow us to live smaller. There's a scary uh, statistic when, or scary I guess in terms of environment, uh, when we look at the amount of square footage that we all used uh, per person in the 1950s, that was about 290 square feet. This is across North America. That's right, North America. And now that number is over 900 square feet. And when 40% of CO2 emissions come from buildings, uh, we know that we have a huge responsibility to somehow shift the thinking on what we actually need. Uh, we had a mechanical engineer who came to us and talked about sustainability and talked about these wonderful mechanical gadgets that he had applied on a house that was 6,000 square feet and him and his wife lived in it. And I looked at him and I said, well, you can't possibly overcome that with anything mechanical um, on top. So that somehow that thinking has to shift. So is that belief uh, that design can allow us to live in smaller spaces if they're properly designed? So the, uh, we've convinced this developer to, uh, to test this in downtown Winnipeg. And typically, we would be building apartments that are 1,000 square feet, 1,200 square feet, two bedrooms, two baths, your standard, standard fare. And here, we've gone down to under 400 square feet per apartment in the old building, but the, um, and it proved that actually mar market was there and the people were interested in living in those spaces because they were well designed. Uh, but the background of the project is quite, um, quite interesting. First, the clients in essence bought, the, uh, bought an existing six-story building, negotiated with the city to start construction the next day, hired us on Monday, and uh, they started building. So the, uh, it took us about a year and a half to finish this. Uh, there were six building permits by the time it was done. And what's interesting about it is they, they kicked it off with this project. They got a grant for 72 units. And the, uh, do you mind going back for okay. a second? Kick, oh. Got a grant for 72 units. And then they bought a building next door, which then realized that they could actually fit a level of parking underneath the project. So these are buildings that are 100 years old, both of them. To, 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 uh, two entirely different construction types. And so then we started working on the parquet. So that was a separate permit. And then, the, uh, then they scored a tenant for the ground floor. They needed a bit more space. So they weren't able to build all the units that they got the grant for. So then they decided they have to put an addition on the existing building. But then we found out that the existing building cannot carry the addition. So we had to put a new foundation through the existing building and so on. So this building was done uh, basically all in one shot, six permits. The city was great to work with. Um, at historic buildings, one of them was protected. But they allowed us to, uh, through that process, allowed us to do two things to the city, which was very important to us. One of, us, one of them was to um, take the ground floor, which was all compromised over the years, and set it back in and create a, create a canopy that then contributed to city life and made that city life um, exist in front of the building. And then it also allowed us to um, to project the balconies out of the, out of the building to announce to the world that we have actually made this building part of the city. And th that was the gesture that was important to us. There's all kinds of numbers and convincing the client why that was important to get balconies onto the building and so on. But the gesture was then to announce that this is happening in the city. So it turned a building that was vacant for about 11 years into a, uh, into a player in, in the city dynamic. And I'll uh, apologize in advance, but yes, so this is our <laughs> This is our two developers. The, it's like the twins from uh, the 1980s movie. Um, the little guy is the, uh, is the actual builder uh, of the two, and then the bigger guy is the sort of the financial uh, arm behind it. And, and uh, the third guy is our mayor at the time. And, and of course, you know, when it's all said and done, then they're excited and it's great. But it was a big battle to get to the balconies, to get to that level of uh, intervention on the building. And, and we've achieved some numbers. greatest densities on this project. Where we're hitting about 266 people per acre, which is truly sustainable. The building's been occupied for now five years. So then the first the sort of public engagement project that we've undertaken uh, called the Migrating Landscapes. This was Canada's representation at the Venice Biennale in Architecture in 2012. Um, and um, we, um, we proposed a project where we wouldn't just go to Venice and do the exhibition there, but which is you know, typically what you would do but that we could actually tour the project across Canada and get more people involved. So Olympics in architecture. So you actually 
that's what happens. The U.S. has its own pavilion. Canada has its own pavilion. All countries have pavilions, and you kind of compete. But in essence, you're representing your country in, a, in, Anyways, a, in architecture. We organized the competition context, Johanna, context. for young architects across the country. And so it wouldn't be just us going, but they could propose a project on it. And then uh, we competed them in these different cities and organized these exhibitions. And, and that way, you know, we had more sponsorships, and there was a new financial model that was uh, created for the project. It's not very well funded, so that was another uh, response to it. Uh, sponsors got or, uh, exposure in Canada, and that was a huge deal. Here are some of the competition entries, and then, um, and then the exhibitions in Canada, the finale in Winnipeg before the final team was selected. Big hoopla. Um, but as always, resources are tight, and uh, when we got to Venice, we we're pretty much out of money. And I told Sasha that, look, we have to get by with 50 euros a day, feed a crew of 12, and... But there it is, they're eating peppers. We <laughs> bought a barbecue, and we're barbecuing next to the, uh, uh, next to the pavilion every day. Um, so it wasn't much variety, but got it done. And uh, here is sort of it, uh, one of my most exciting moments, talking to Peter Simtor, one of the great sort of Swiss well, architects. We understand was here yeah. a few years back. Anyway. Oh, he didn't come to Juno. All oh, right, he cut oh, it. Oh, shoot. Okay. Sorry for mentioning Anyway, that. we've heard some things. Um, but <laughs> this is all to say that what we're fighting is really apathy. It's about apathy about architecture, about, about not having an opinion about buildings, and, and trying to make sure that whatever people's opinion is, that they have one. And um, I think the OMS stage, which is a small band shell in the center of the historic core of Winnipeg, is a good story to illustrate that point. That there was a small competition in 2011 or 10, Nine. I think, that we won. Um, and um, it was with a very simple scheme of a, a cube. And the point here was that we sort of, you could see the, the stage here. Um, that was sort of faux uh, historic that was built in the 1970s and always felt empty because there were only 44 events a year that took place there. So 321 days of the year, it was empty. And it felt really sad. And we live right next door to it and sort of could see this. And so we wanted to propose something that would feel complete uh, at, the, at those times when it was closed. And it became sort of this object uh, that could be a beacon, could be an exhibition space, could house events could then open up into a stage itself and uh, could sort of hibernate and feel like it has a life um, beyond those other times. Be beyond the events, yeah. yeah. So, so what happened, this is it when it's dormant uh, on, a, on a gloomy summer, I think, day. But the, uh, one of the things that, that was key in the development of the project was the discovery that we can actually, through solid uh, objects, if we, if we configure them right way, project and get light to emanate from the object. So it needed to be alive. And this sort of shows you that with this sort of Venetian blind-like system that we developed with these little skewed cubes, if you project from one side, actually the image is going to go to the other side. So this is sort of the, how that system works. That allowed us not only to use light and emanate light through the structure, but also use images and show, show moving images and so on on the, on the front stage. So it's a custom extruded aluminum, and it's sliced like almost like salami. There's 20,000 pieces that are then woven together uh, with stainless steel cable. And the only reason we were able to do a custom screen that could then be flexible and open up was the fact that we worked with the local Hutterite colony that's just north of the city, a religious colony that specialized in laser cutting and water jetting. And this is Melvin Kleinsasser, our new best friend at the time, um, who could just do anything and has been the greatest collaborator ever since. We've clad buildings, like Johanna talked about projects where we can only afford a few, few materials. We've clad buildings with custom aluminum because we have access to doing custom custom materials and so on. But the, the, the stage itself, um, what was interesting about it, it became a very tranquil space, as you can see it here. It, it turns into a party, party room um, in the city. It is a beacon, as you can see it here, uh, when it's light. And then the, uh, it becomes a stage. Um, for, the, uh, for all of our fest summer festivals. So you can see a band on the left side and, and, and almost serene chapel-like quality on the right-hand side. It's the most popular place to take your wedding pictures in the city now, which is mind-boggling. Um, but um, it, it, you know, the events have quadrupled, and that really is the story of why we think it's a success. 
the other part of that story is the, uh, is the thing that it really divided up opinions. And people thought it was the ugliest bloody thing ever um, in the center of this historic core. And there was real fights about it. There was actually a Facebook page uh, for demolishing the cube at the end that people established. But uh, we thought this was great because we're actually having a conversation. We're talking about design values and what they are and why they matter. And like we said, now it's, uh, it's sort of very popular. But um, moving on then, uh, in 2013, we, um, we convinced the Canada Council for the Arts uh, to give us a grant for something called Table for 12. And it's basically us going to say eight different cities around the world and trying to find out what makes architecture and design culture tick and what maintains it, who creates it, and so on. With the idea of bringing that back to Winnipeg, bringing it back to Canada and trying to, again, work on, on, the, on the projects that, that revive that. But in essence, we got a lot of money to go eat dinner and drink wine with a bunch of important people. So that was, you know, pretty awesome. But um, we went to Lisbon. We learned all kinds of lessons. We went to Copenhagen, New York, uh, Mexico City, Tokyo, Sydney. And, uh, and then finally, um, I would tell you about those lessons, but I don't think we have time. Finally, then brought it back to Winnipeg as part of the uh, Royal Architecture Institute of Canada's annual conference. It's and the AIA festival. You know, we have to have a really cool finale for this thing. And so we, instead of organizing it. wasn't it, just the cool, it was about engaging our politician and decision makers. That's right. That they, we could design. make a splash and that design matters and people are actually getting engaged. So we organized a t uh, dinner for table, or dinner for 1200 instead. So table for 1200. And it was a great success and now has become an annual event to, um, to fundraise money for design, design advocacy, events yeah. and advocacy in the city. This is one of my favorite tweets from the evening. Uh, the one thing that we did do wrong in the planning is we ran out of wine. <laughs> but um, it, otherwise it turned out great. Within an hour we had over 600 Instagram feeds from the, from the site and people were really excited just to come together and have a conversation. And it's amazing what you know, food and wine do to that, do to that conversation too to liven it. Um, and then uh, on to uh, Ucube, which is one of our uh, little housing projects, 18 units. We had a young developer who came to work with us. And um, he basically was framing houses before he, uh, before he had his first big project. And because of that, he was able to use residential construction trades. And those are actually quite a bit cheaper than when you move up to the commercial level. And so for that reason, we, instead of designing one sort of big, uh, complete building, we divided up into 18 separate suites that could still be under the building code considered. So what's interesting, it's actually in building. what used to be our red light district. So one of the first things that we've done, we've sort of Why dealt. Why do you always bring that up? But I think I, because I think we made a move, which was okay. important, which was to, to create a public plaza, if you wish, one that connects all the little cubes, about six feet off the ground, park underneath it, so cover parking, but not make it outside, or sorry, inside, so you're not making it solid. And from that place, all the units are accessed. So you can see here one of the, one of the doors into the unit. And this place has been claimed. This picture is totally staged. We removed all the, all the flower pots that, that people have put out and benches and things like that. But they are using that space as a shared yard. So it's for the pictures right, we removed right, them. Right, not, right. You know, we're not <laughs> yeah, policing we around. <laughs> no. OK. And then um, I guess these, these things are fairly vertical. So then at the top of them, there's also a rooftop for every <laughs> unit so that the community not only has the place where, where they enter the suites to gather in, but they can also lean over the guardrail and talk to their neighbors. So that's one of the things that's, that, that's happening. It was a nightmare in terms of the building code and understanding how these buildings Spatial be. separations for those architects out there. Um, very complicated thing, but finally got through and it was all worth it in the end. Um, on the inside, what we were interested in trying something new with the interior space, and instead of doing just you know rooms, uh, we conceived this sort of wrap that has all the living spaces in it, coiled it up inside, and that sort of created a fairly interesting space inside. It's of course not for everybody. Um, the reason why we often end up doing this type of a building is the fact that um, you don't have to have a public corridor that you can't either sell or rent out. And this is important, again, for making the profit for the development. So we got these soaring spaces. You do have to go up the stairs in the suite. Um, From one level to another end. But there was sort of a wow factor. And in the end, sort of proved the point that people will pay for design when they, instead of looking at the per square foot price, and they would go like, wow, I like this space, I'll buy it. 
and that was really great. Um, we did go through some troubles in trying to convince the, uh, the builder that is actually quite simple. And then that's where perception comes in. So instead of getting into the unknowns, we actually built a framing model to show exactly how it would be built uh, so there would be no uh, uncertainties. The interesting anecdote, I guess, the, the one that says 530 on it uh, was, uh, was the first unit that was up for sale. It was up for sale for $300,000. It sold for four. Uh, after obviously people came in and then we realized that it, it is the quality or in this case if you wish the cubic foot that sold the space which was the space that you were in rather than the square footage which is how we usually think about architecture which is completely backwards but that's a lecture on its own um, or a presentation on its the own. The other thing we believe in is that architecture is a long process and if you can have a beer with your client at the end of the day after the long process where most things go wrong at some point then it's been a good process and so this is us celebrating a design award that we got in Cannes with the developer who's who's in the tie. In the tie um, <laughs> yeah and uh, that again in numbers you know analyzing it afterwards and seeing what we got. Um, this is the, this is the developer and prior to getting drunk but it almost feels better to say after. yes well um, and uh, sometimes you know you end up going again through this long process and oftentimes you just need to have a bit more energy than the things that are, are obstacles. So here, and maybe we tired him out, I don't know. But um, success. It was important to tire yeah, him out. Yeah, it was important to tire him out. He's happy though, don't <laughs> take me wrong. Um, so I guess this boils down to the idea that we think that there's such a thing as design economy and that design pays off and it's a good investment. And I think that the parallels to what we currently, I think, as a, as a culture across North America and maybe the world believe that people are really wanting to take time to enjoy life and experiences are becoming more important than you know your big uh, house and white picket fence and a car and a, and a career but more that it's about investing in quality and uh, in this case you know maybe Starbucks and the chains are out and the third wave coffees and who knows uh, we take time to sort of spend uh, spend it with family as opposed to in our cars commuting um, we believe that there might be alternates to the, to the way that and how far we want to live from, from work and that there, it's the shared experiences that really matter and maybe in there that it's important to invest in things that actually are well designed. I always uh, show this picture of the Finnish mark or Finnish money uh, at the time when I grew up. It has, an al it has an architect on it as opposed to a president, overall to one of the more famous architects in the world. And, and uh, again, about that value, what we place in it, and we hope someday maybe Canada will have an architect mm -hmm. on the money, mm -hmm. who knows. Alaska for sure. Yeah, Alaska for sure. But anyway, so getting involved in, uh, in, um, in other organizations like the Chamber of Commerce is an important way that we can then bring that design discussion back into business people's uh, minds or... Mm -hmm. Are you going to say something? Well, these are purely purely saying that we are trying to get our projects, pu pushing them into publications, pushing them through the exhibits and so on, in order to raise awareness about design in Winnipeg and architecture in Winnipeg. And that feeds back to our city through multiple ways, either by uh, by the myth that, that, that seems to have been created about quality of architecture in Winnipeg, or by, uh, actually not a myth, by, 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 by true things that are happening. So there's and been doing a, things. There's um, been a million things that have been happening in the last eight years in Winnipeg or the last ten years in Winnipeg that have changed the landscape of architecture. And we, we've been part of it, and we're very fortunate to have been part of that. Winnipeg has the world's longest skating trail on the river that cuts through the city. And uh, about five years ago, uh, five firms, uh, including us, designed a warming hut on that river. And it's now become an annual, con uh, annual international competition uh, where people send uh, entries from around the world and then also we invite a celebrity architect like Frank Gehry or somebody to come up and, and yeah, do a Frank hut. Yeah, we got Frank Gehry to do a hut a few years back. Now we're hoping to get Brad Pitt to do, to do another one. Um, and it, it, I'm it's, definitely it's, hoping for that. <laughs> and so it's definitely this idea, this idea of, of, of doing architecture that, is, that can be close to people's heart, can be very accessible, and then people start to talk about it. So it's not all about the airports and the, uh, the large project, but it's about, about these little ones that, are, that make you feel we like you're taken care of. We also have a design festival that's on its uh, fifth year now. Uh, we do a thing called On the Boards, where architects come together and dis discuss their design projects when they're still in development in the hopes that we collectively then raise the bar 
on the quality of work that gets produced. Well, warming Huts actually spawned one amazing thing, which is this thing called Raw Almond, which is a restaurant on ice. So every year they build this restaurant out of, out of tent. You, you dine on ice. It costs 130 bucks to get a dinner. It's, it's a spectacular gourmet sort of a celebration. Five courses. Last year, I think they had about 30 chefs cooking for three weeks. Uh, people are paying 130 bucks plus tips, plus, uh, plus uh, alcohol. The dinner sold in about, all dinner sold in about a day, and it, it's a spectacular celebration. If you need tickets, just ask him. He's getting commission, It's clearly. a spectacular yeah. <laughs> combination of people actually enjoying life and enjoying winter and actually celebrating. Yeah, the point the is that I guess winter is becoming exotic, and that's something that people are seeking out from around the world, and, and we're benefiting. So uh, we're also hosting Winnipeg Architecture Foundation in our space, uh, renting them space uh, so that they can have a storefront, and they're doing tours and all kinds of things. We have a regular column in the F Winnipeg Free Press now uh, by a colleague who, who writes it. Uh, we, last year, we organized an architecture fringe festival that included things like urban golf um, in the exchange district and movie nights. You and can the all do urban golf if you Yes, wish. that's right. We tried to take our class at the University of Manitoba out to cafes and, and, and so the presentations could be available for public. We had a mayoral debate last, uh, last year. It's uh, a bit late for you, but the... Uh, <laughs> Through the design community uh, to talk about design issues as part of the part of the candidates platform, uh, that spawned a city beautiful book, which is a book on architecture that became a, a local top seller or bestseller. And then we're hoping that in the end we can wrap this all nightly, nicely up into the first Winter Pig Biennale uh, at some point in 2017. And try to put it all into one package so, so you guys can come to Winnipeg and That's celebrate right. you winter too with us. You can yeah. come to Winnipeg. Okay, so another project, uh, again, feeding on this typology, sorry for the architectural word, but meaning that it's three-story walk-up. Uh, there's no public corridor. We were tasked to design <coughs> 10 condominiums on the site. It's 100 feet wide, and we thought it would be important to get cross-ventilation. It's quite a different. There's a street on one side and the neighborhood on the other side, and couldn't just slice it up into 10 uh, suites, because obviously that would mean that they would only be 10 feet wide. So we ended up doing a bit of a Chinese puzzle and tacking them together in this way. And what it resulted in is not only to get the cross ventilation and, and separate levels for, for every unit, but also that um, eight out of the 10 units would, uh, would be corner suites. This makes a big difference in the real estate market because you can sell the corner suite. But the realtor still doesn't know what, what unit is where and how it works, which is kind of funny. But we were, we were picturing how, you know, it would be interesting how people could rub shoulders with one another and how what you see there is a bit of a screen that separates the, uh, the suites from the street. And that space in between, just with the, the building wall and the screen, could become uh, a place to hang out and talk to your neighbor and try to get this sort of separation and Otherwise get connectivity. Otherwise Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> but you can see that, you know, the cowgirl is having a good time in there. This is sort of the, the nature of the screen is such that that, that encapsulates the life between it itself and, and the building and then provides a complete privacy when you're driving by. So you see out but you, you can't see in. The, um, okay, keep yeah. going. Okay, we're gonna keep watch on time. Um, one thing that we're trying to also campaign for is a quality-based selection. So when you select an architect or design professional, uh, this is through the Manitoba Association of Architects, that you know, it's not based on, uh, or it's not based on the, the lowest price, which is oftentimes the poorest criteria to, to, to select somebody for you to do a good job on a design project. We discovered that in Canada, in public agencies, the people that, that procure toilet paper also procure architectural services, and they use the same sort of measuring devices to decide what architects <laughs> to use. Yeah, and so when we sell time, or when it's really, uh, I guess, a matter of how much time you put, that that's how good your project will be. And in the end, this becomes an important, uh, important criteria, an important process. Um, and good is not as good as great, uh, I guess, is what we're trying to um, we're trying to convince the public decision makers of. And it will actually cost you less in the end when you think about when the design professional does their work properly, then you spend less time on construction site, less effort there, and certainly the uh, life cycle cost of a building over the years can be improved significantly. So it's not about money uh, in our pockets, but it's about creating better value, and that's really what we're trying to do, to, so that we can create for all of us a greater quality of life. 
and it, the numbers are actually staggering when you look at how small of an increment of the total life cycle cost of a building that design process is. It's, it's pretty uh, important to pay attention. And all attention. the decisions that have to do with the remaining 90, what, 98 or 99 percent um, are made in that one or two percent of investment. Frank Lloyd Wright said it best. Um, so it's much easier to use the eraser, uh, eraser at the drafting table than the hammer on the construction site. Sledgehammer. Sledgehammer. To demolish, I suspect. That's is, right. Is exactly. Um, Go for it. The other way we've, uh, we've sort of taken, <laughs> or a computer, that's right. The other way we've tried to t become players, or not players in the city, but we've tried to, to affect the city or change the city. Here you can see um, a photograph was taken off a... Um, You're supposed to look that way. Right, off a... <laughs> Okay, so the photograph is taken off, off a rooftop of one of our towers in downtown. You can see the sea of parking lots. And the, uh, with a bunch of friends, we actually, uh, colleagues, developers, we, we purchased a small 33 by 108 foot lot, which is right where this little house that says build, building and land for sale is um, sitting on. And, and did a project hoping that we can actually attract investors uh, and, and, and build an office building. Now, the office, office market in Winnipeg is dead today, so nothing has happened other than we've actually shown a project that could happen on that site that was uh, extremely exciting, brought us a lot of notoriety in terms of uh, what it did, did for us. Uh, we've tested our, our brains, created a project that was punched through in order to bring light. We couldn't put windows on the sides because those are property lines. Those of you that are architects will understand that. And created a building that there are uh, other smart people in the audience. Yeah, too. fair I'm enough. Yeah. Sure. Create a building yeah. for us that, that, that won as a Progressive Architecture Project of the Year Award uh, a few years back. And the, uh, we're still hoping to build it uh, the, uh, once the market, of course, recovers. In the meantime, we're going to try to do something with the site that makes a difference. I'm not sure what the point of showing this was. I have hey, no idea. There it is. There it is, yeah. It was good. <laughs> uh, the, the next project is called 62M. And uh, it was done for the same development group that had the guy who previously built the U-Cubes that you can see in this, in this picture over here. The and tired guy. What was, um, what was interesting about it is that they asked us whether we can actually imagine having housing on that site. It's uh, bordered by a freeway on the north and then back of industrial buildings and this U-Cube project on the south. And so really no windows. Yeah, so this um, is the only street access there. So this is sitting on the site. That's what it looks like around it. Yeah, um, and so it early on came, uh, became clear to us that the only way that we could really make a go of it would be to lift it up. And then, of course, that's not cheap. It's not cheap, certainly not in, in um, cold you know, climates. northern cold, cold climates. And from there on, we had to figure out other ways that we could then overcome having to lift it up. And um, we did a bunch of tests and went through all kinds of processes to uh, try to figure out what to do here. And then figured that, um, and some of you may, the smart people in the audience. They'll know this before <laughs> we did, but we realized that a donut is, a, is a, in terms of envelope, much smaller than a square donut. So that so meaning that you get more access to window, which dictates how many apartments you can have. And the, the public corridor in the center is shorter. And so there's less space that you're building that you can't sell. So we've saved about 30% on envelope, and that gave project the go-ahead in 2011, and we're just now building it. So the, uh, in essence, the spaceship on, on stilts sitting with a, with a core in the middle, and that's what it looks like, what it will look like once it gets built, and we, we are planting 62 um, yeah, plant trees around the project in order to get it to um, sort of land in, in, in an environment that, that um, settled it in, in, in space there. Um, the interiors are fairly simple. Johanna, do you mind oh, yeah? going there? And the, uh, the, the real power. emphasis is on the view out onto, into the city. And the project, uh, what's interesting about the project, you can see here, each unit is identical. Oops, that was brilliant. Um, the um, <laughs> you probably pie can't shape see a thing. accesses, accesses <laughs> at, the, at the corridor, and we're putting all the utilities where there's least amount of light, bedroom, and the living room on the, uh, I'm moving at the on. window. I'm moving on, can't see a thing. <laughs> okay, but the great thing about it is that it is fairly iconic and it, it was there for a reason. We didn't just invent it because it aesthetically looked cool, but there was a reason for its existence this way. And it ends up selling itself. So it, this sort of billboard uh, attitude in the city and people seeing us, they're ri driving to downtown, is really helping the re realtor a great deal. And it was uh, part of the project, it's, it's getting constructed for under $160 a square foot. And what we understand, uh, the pricing in Winnipeg is similar to, to that of Anchorage, both in terms of salaries that people make and the cost of construction. So that sort of gives you a fairly, uh, fairly good understanding of the project itself. Um, 
Yeah, then this is a project we something. talked a lot about here when we started walking through the Yeah, uh, through and the city. so we were engaged last year to be site advisors for one of our public uh, organizations that is a steward of this land in the foreground. So the little slice, the green bit in the front there, and Winnipeg downtown is in the, in the back there. Winnipeg, of course, is a sprawling uh, Midwestern city that suffers from the same issues that many American cities do, uh, which is dilapidation of the downtown and people just moving out to the outskirts and not having that vibrancy. And um, this is uh, the confluence of the two rivers, the center point where people have met, uh, indigenous people have gathered for over 6,000 years. It's and basically where the city started. That's 6, right. In the last years. hundred years, though, they became this rail yard and manufacturing spot where you receive goods from the river yeah, and then transport crazy. them into the city. Wanna white? Do you want to just stay there? Or? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'll then hide here. in 1990 uh, ish, uh, it was turned into a public recreation area as industry moved out and services became more important. And now we have the Winnipeg's most popular <coughs> tourist destination, receives over four million people a year. Back. Um, you're back, okay. So it's sort of a Winnipeg's playground and this is where the river uh, skating trail starts and so on. People gather to get drinks and you know celebrate winter and go to the market and it's all great. Uh, we also then have uh, the museum we mentioned earlier, the Canadian Museum of Human Rights that was just opened last fall. But what's left over is another uh, parking lot uh, there called the rail side that's still empty, it's surface expensive. parking lot. And now there's been approval by the city to build housing on the site, to try to create that density, residential, residential density in the downtown area. So last summer, what was approved was this sort of schematic scheme of eight big buildings, towers in essence, um, on the site, uh, you know, envisioning something Big from city an stuff. outer this world. This is not that. This, this is, is not, not it. it. But, um, you know, so, so eight big buildings, you know, we're not Vancouver, we're not Toronto. Um, once we got involved, we started studying, you know, what is actually locally appropriate and looked at the study from Berlin uh, neighborhoods and realized that you can create a higher density by having buildings that are maximum six stories tall. Um, because of the distance that's, um, distance that's required between taller buildings actually creates a less dense uh, ground plane and less vibrant ground plane. And so here's the sort of project area. Now we're in the second phase of it trying to reinvent uh, what this housing could look like. And the one of the first tasks that we did is look at how does the old exchange district, um, the historic core of Winnipeg, fits on that side. So just basically to get a superimpose sense of the, the piece of our city in, into the parking lots just to see how much there is. And so that opened the eyes of the, of the government and people that are involved and said, okay, well, okay, I get it now. I get how big if it is. If you've been to uh, Barcelona, La Rambla there is uh, also pictured and we're sort of s seeing how, how that would fit. Or six uh, city blocks from New York City yeah, it gives you a sense of how large the 11 acres actually really is. And finally, Seville, uh, just to get the sort of finer grain and I tried to picture how we could potentially, I don't know. Develop do it. So that like resonated, that. actually. It was very interesting. And, and the, today when we landed, uh, or David was giving us a tour of the city, we're starting to James. get... Sorry, James. Sorry, J sorry James. Yes. Uh, it, it was giving us sort of an understanding that the, that scale, the proximity of the two buildings, the gate, uh, looking at each other, the narrowness of the street, the tightness is what actually makes these places spectacular. And so everybody bought in into that. And these are just tests that came out of the first study which, which uh, forced us into a split between open space and buildings of 40 to 60 percent. So these, these things are uh, sort of just graphic studies of how much building the Reds there are building. Um, are building so we're so required much we to put 40 percent, uh, 40 percent of the um, um, area to be, be buildings and 60 percent to be public space and that's you know what we're trying to work with and see this grain and and then I think uh, we also sort of decided that perhaps it's best if the ground plane is all public. Instead of just being 60% public, then can we make it so that there are shops and there are things that people can go to, but none of it's really private. Um, and so again, we played with Legos, our favorite things to do. Try to understand what is the right distance between buildings. What is the sort of social distance that creates the, the nice human scale that uh, we know and recognize when we go to a great city and it's walkable and it feels right. Um, so what are the things that we, we would need to do to kind of get this right? Access to light, of course, hugely important in a northern climate um, so that it feels comfortable in there. 
And as a result, I think the, the development framework is now starting to look something like this, uh, where we're limiting the development to six stories. You get a lot of surface area in there, so the stickiness factor is there. Instead of speeding through the space, you actually want to stay and linger. You have to and wander through it, right? Yeah. And, and, and on a market level, what it also did is, instead of us having to import large developers to build those towers from larger cities, we are now being able to rely on 30 or 40 smaller developers that can all build this. and, and we're that way, it's not the fact that we're reinvesting into the local economy, it is the fact that we're building something that's suitable, it's authentic. And that's, that's sort of the full spiel or sale on that. And the, uh, some of these uh, successes in the past have, have landed us a few projects in bigger cities, so now we're trying to export wisdom or collate to, uh, to Toronto. This is our first project in Toronto that we're working on, and it, it went through several iterations. We've, we've discovered the planning um, authorities in Toronto are even more conservative than, than, than the ones in Winnipeg, perhaps because they've seen too many things uh, go sideways. So we are proposing uh, a project that's definitely ground-oriented. It's, it's, it's composed of three separate buildings, all trying to be a part of the whole. So if you look at this next, next slide, you're going to see how the, uh, how the buildings are sort of similar. They go from highest to lowest, and then they look like they've stretched this, this grid uh, through the site. But we were able to um, to d develop a number of units that are fitting and interlocking in the space, again, ground-oriented. Uh, this is the building on the street. Uh, this is the, this, these are the townhouses on the low end. And people are encouraged to spend time outside, whether it's the roof decks or spaces in between buildings. Th th these are lush courtyards that we've, uh, we're envisioning everybody looking down to and concentrating the, uh, the eyes, again, onto the public space. We also try to keep ourselves fresh by participating in competitions around the world with, with you know, not that much success, but nevertheless, mostly failures. Um, mostly failures. Uh, this was a design competition for an art gallery in Victoria in British Columbia, and uh, uh, we lost, <coughs> but then uh, somehow managed to make lemonade out of it uh, by submitting it to World Architecture Festival and, and winning a prestigious World Architecture or was it? It was future a future project, project so year. for unbuilt projects they're giving awards. So <laughs> we are heading to Singapore yeah. to jury the next uh, the next winner next uh, in a couple months. In a we couple weeks. We also participated as as every architect around the world did uh, to the Helsinki Guggenheim uh, design competition, and um, and this was sort of our scheme and and know more about it. But it, but you know it was great to kind of test your. Uh, test your skills and try to imagine what the atmosphere of the architecture could be in addition to just you know making uh, the money stretch the furthest uh, which has been kind of what we have been tasked to do in Winnipeg. And it was very important of course of course for Johanna because it was in Helsinki so we had no choice but to do the, uh, That's do the right. competition itself. These but are tough things that as a professional you have to do but aren't you know obviously very profitable. But they are helping <laughs> us internally develop a culture, develop a culture, do the research on things that we, uh, we've tested here that we might actually end up doing on projects. And there's a couple of things that we've, we've done there that we're now testing on another project. So th they become sort of internal research laboratories. And finally, we're still waiting to hear how this went, but uh, it, we're on the five finalists for the Peterborough Canoe Museum in Ontario and are imagining a scheme where you could go through this naturalized birch grove to get to the museum and get yourself prepared for the canoe experience. And, and hopefully uh, competing again, you know, against really big guys from Toronto and, and or not Toronto, but New York and Ireland and so on, and uh, we'll see what happens. So it's very interesting that the, uh, we're not trying to, to exercise our, uh, our muscles outside. We're doing a very small project in Calgary, uh, this little shed. It's, it's sort of located on the end of a new street. On the other end of the street is the, uh, the new $300 million library. We have a $70,000 for our little garden shed. It really is for storing uh, garden, tools. garden tools. And the, uh, so, so we said this, the cheapest enclosure you can buy, obviously, the shipping <coughs> container. You have a lot of them in Alaska. Um, the, uh, and then we said, how can we actually make lemonade out of a out of shipping lemonade container? Lemonade again? Well, <laughs> make something more out of it, did I think, is the already? point. Okay, yes, cool. I did say lemonade. Yeah, so we so tried. Kind of so we took three, three of them and stretched this sort of corrugated mesh around them, which is the cheapest, uh, cheapest metal we can buy, which is the lath. And you can see how it actually does create a space. It has that civic response to a, to, to a place rather than, um, rather than being just the utility shed, which is where they started And we're picturing off. the light kind of filtering through there, and now we're just putting it together in Winnipeg and um, uh, getting ready to ship out uh, to Calgary in the next Week couple or so. of yep. uh, days. 
Um, and then, then to our final project, uh, this was something that uh, we did two, uh, three years ago now, put four uh, used IKEA chairs outside of our office, $49.99 each, so $200 project, and put some architecture magazines out there, hoping that people rearrange them and actually read about architecture and have a conversation with us. And you can see how engaged the public is, goodness. But what it did, it spawned another idea then uh, later on um, this year, this last uh, month really, uh, called Chair Your Idea. And it was, a, it was a competition that we invented for the citizens of Winnipeg. So anybody, any Winnipegger could submit an idea. All they had to do is make sure that we could do it about a, for about $30,000. And there was a registration fee of $25 to submit an idea. They had to boil it down to 140 characters and write their idea on the chair uh, that had to be white. Uh, this is our mayor. He loves photo ops, and the, uh, he he's, he fully endorsed the uh, competition and promised he's going to look into all the he's ideas. He's going to look got into submitted. every idea, which I think was the key to for, to for the success. And we collected 740 ideas in the end. People went really out of town, like designing chairs, even which wasn't part of the original plan. But um, you could encounter these in the city. You could say, you could say, oh, that's a great idea. We should do that and then um, end up submitting their own. We also had a game for the world's, well, Canada's largest musical chairs at the end of it, the, uh, at the finale of it, and we had a jury select the, the winning idea. And then, with the registration fees, we are able to now implement the winning idea. So it doesn't take a lot uh, to do a lot. Thank you. Are you gonna go there? Goodbye. on it.